we use this plot for several slides here. This is basically a HO plot that's set up with ISO lines of deuterium excess. Deuterium excess is defined here. Okay. Deuterium excess, importantly, is a property of a water, a, a, a water sample that we've measured, right? Okay. So it's something that we can calculate anytime we have a hydrogen isotope value and an oxygen isotope value for a water sample. And it's simply the hydrogen isotope value minus eight times the oxygen isotope value. So what are we effectively doing by, cal by calculating deuterium excess? It's kind of correcting for something. It's, it's eliminating something from the information that we have. What's it eliminating? Equilibrium, Equilibrium effects, yeah. So equili equilibrium fractionation is going to move us up and down a line with about a slope of eight, right? And so by calculating deuterium excess, we're basically subtracting out any influence of equilibrium fractionation on our sample. Right? We could be down here at really low, delta 18 O values are way up there at really high, delta 18 O values. Right? We could have had a lot of Raleigh distillation affecting our sample um, over relative to some other sample. But if we calculate deuterium excess, if there's no kinetic effect that moves us off one of these ISO lines, right, moves us away from that slope eight relationship, then we'll get the same deuterium excess value. And so that's where this becomes useful. So how does this relate to the Gold Meark water line? Let's look at it. All right, you already told me seawater is zero, zero, right? That's the hydrogen oxygen isotope composition of seawater. My plotting's not perfect here, but there it is. What's the deuterium excess value of seawater? Well, it's zero per mil, right? Okay. What's the intercept of the global meteoric water line? 10, okay. So the global meteoric water line is plotted up there, right? And you can see seawater doesn't fall on it. So seawater is the source of the water that's evaporated in the atmosphere, but something is giving the water in the atmosphere a different deuterium excess value than seawater. So if seawater is evaporated at 100% relative humidity, what would you expect the deuterium excess of the vapor to be? It's kind of a Silly trick question, right? But if you evaporate at 100% relative humidity, that becomes what kind of a process? Equilibrium again, right? So that 1 minus h term in the equation I showed you goes to 0. We only have the equilibrium fractionation. So it would give us a vapor with a deuterium excess value of 0, the same as the seawater that we started with. But as I already mentioned, if the atmosphere is saturated, 100% relative humidity, there's no net flux into the atmosphere, right? And that's not the condition generally, right? Uh, the atmosphere globally has got a humidity of about 85%. Right? So it's undersaturated. That means there's some kinetic fractionation expressed. Okay. So 80, 85% is the relative humidity of the free atmosphere of the oceans, okay? That means there is some expression of the kinetic isotope effect. And what's the implication? That means that the Fractionation, the net fractionation, the line that we get for that evaporation process has a slope lower than eight. Okay. It lies whoop, here in this shaded zone. Okay. And so as we take seawater and we evaporate from it into the real atmosphere, we follow that red line there. Okay. And we end up producing a vapor that has a higher deuterium excess. The hydrogen isotope ratios, the oxygen isotope ratios are lower than seawater because the light isotopes prefer to jump into the vapor phase. Okay. But when we put the two isotope systems together, what we see is that the deuterium excess is shifted and the resulting vapor has a de-excess of about plus 10. Does that make sense? So that gives us the intercept of the global meteoric water line because that vapor is the starting point for the whole Raleigh distillation cascade that follows, right? Over the oceans, right, we're evaporating that water, we're producing a vapor that has a de-excess of about plus 10, and then we move that vapor across the globe, and it rains out progressively. And that rain out affects the hydrogen isotope ratio and the oxygen isotope ratio, but it doesn't change the de-excess. So if anybody ever asks you why the intercept of the global meteoric water line is plus 10, right, you can tell them it's because relative humidity of the free atmosphere of the ocean is 80 to 85%. Okay? That's what's doing it. 
and it gives us a kinetic fractionation there. All right, so then we're producing moisture, or sorry, rain that falls along this line through an equilibrium process, and the rest is history. All right, one more thing for our next break. So again, the slope of the evaporation line in HO space is going to depend on the humidity. And so let's say we have some time in the past, in the future, when global atmospheric conditions are different and we have a much lower humidity in the free atmosphere. All right, let's say the free atmospheric humidity is 60% or something. How is that going to affect the global meter aquatic line? Are we going to have the same global meter aquatic line we have today? Okay, so what's going to change about the global meter aquatic line? The slope or the intercept? Let's start there. Okay, we got both answers. The right answer is the intercept, okay? It's not going to affect the slope because remember the slope is set by the fact that rainfall falls out when we have a saturated environment. And that means equilibrium fractionation, okay? So you have to saturate the air mass in order to produce rainfall. So that shouldn't change in the future. That's just a fundamental property of how we get rain to fall out of the sky, right? Um, we have to have saturation. We have to have equilibrium conditions. What will change is that the evaporation of water into the atmosphere is going to happen under different conditions. And at a lower relative humidity, oops, here we go, we're going to have a lower slope for the evaporation line. Okay? And that means the vapor we're producing back here on this end of the evaporation line is going to have a higher DXS. Okay. So this is something that's been used in paleoclimate. If we can go back and measure old you know, rainwater, for example, we may be able to tell globally, or we may be able to tell just kind of regionally, the regions where the water is coming from to a particular ice core site, for example. If we can look at the DXS, we may be able to tell something about changes in humidity of the atmosphere in these vapor source regions over time. Okay. Here's a map of DXS, and in the interest of time, we won't talk about it too much, but this is precipitation DXS interpolated from precip observation stations over the globe. And what you can see is the DXS varies a decent amount. On the whole, it averages about plus 10, but we have places where it's quite a bit higher and places where it's quite a bit lower. Right? And so you can go and look at this in the original paper or in the notes or whatever um, and think about it a little bit, but these patterns are probably telling us something about regional differences in where the water vapor is coming from and the conditions uh, over the ocean or over the source areas in different places. OK, and so we can use the same idea in thinking about deuterium excess to think about evaporation after rain falls. So let's take a lake, for example. We have isotope ratios for lake water that fall somewhere on or close to the meteoric water line, the global meteoric water line there, right? because that's water that's come into that lake uh, from rainfall. But it sits there in the lake or in the reservoir, right? And it's exposed to the atmosphere. And so it's going to lose water to the atmosphere over time through evaporation. Okay. And let's say we have you know, conditions of very low relative humidity. We're going to get a very low slope of our evaporation line. Okay. And so we're going to produce water vapor from that lake that may have a very, very high deuterium excess value. Okay. And so, for example, we and others have used this to look at rainfall in places uh, like the Midwestern US, where you have the Great Lakes. Right? Those are big, exposed pools of water in the middle of the, con middle of the continent. Right? And they're a potential source of water to the atmosphere. And what we have here is a fairly distinctive signature for having that water added to the atmosphere. Right. When the water evaporates out of the lake, if the relative humidity conditions are lower, and because the lake has a different DXS value to start with than the, um, than the ocean source, right, than ocean water, we can produce vapor with a very high term excess value, and we can see that uh, expressed in the atmosphere, actually, right, if we go out and measure vapor or measure precipitation. Okay. And then the last thing here is just to point out, as I mentioned earlier, that if we go to any given place and measure a bunch of rainwater samples, for example, you know, these two places here, we get lines that don't necessarily match the global meteoric water line exactly. 
So the GMWL is plotted in the background there. You can see actually that rainfall from both of these places, if you look at them together, cluster around the global New York waterline. But at each individual location, we see a slightly offset relationship. And so two things to point out here. One is this can tell us something about the processes that bring moisture to that place. We won't get into this too much, but we can learn from these relationships. And it's going to tell us something about the history of the air right, that's producing precipitation at different seasons or different times or through different storm systems at these different places. Okay? And there's some work out there looking at that. The other thing is if you're interested in using water isotopes as a tracer for things that receive water from precipitation, if we're looking downstream at trees, at streams, at groundwater, for example, we can use the global meteoric water line to kind of approximate what we would expect precipitation to look like. But you may be better off going out and building a local meteoric water line like this to characterize the, the rain at your site. 